Good morning, and thank you for joining me on the Path to Liberty. I'm Michael Bolden with the Tenth Amendment Center, and this is the Fast Friday edition of the show for August 5th, 2022. And on this episode, I've got an introduction to inflation, something that's absolutely hammering all of us normal people right now. I'm going to talk a little bit about how the founding generation actually used a different term, and it has a lot of meaning to it. I'm also going to uh, briefly discuss Thomas Jefferson's 1814 prediction on bank paper. Then I'm going to get into the technical definition of what inflation really is, and then how supporters of the monster state have redefined that term to support the expansion and growth of centralized power and government, how they use inflation a little bit, and then a little bit more from Thomas Jefferson and George Washington. But first of all, before getting to that, a quick hello and a huge thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Whether this is your first episode or you've been here for every single one since day one, but since it's Fast Friday, I promise to not take up too much of your time. Let's see if I can get this info out to you in the next 10 to 15 minutes. And I should point out that if you want to follow along with the stuff that I mentioned in this episode, original source documents, uh, other articles and things like that, because there's a lot of reading that you can do, and I'm just going to be scratching the surface on this today, you definitely want to follow us over at 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty. You're going to find all the different platforms we're on, all the archives of the show for over four years and individual episodes. I publish a blog post about one to two hours after the live stream is done. And there you'll find all the stuff that I'm mentioning in the show link sec section of each episode. Again, 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty. Let's start out with the founding generation, of course. And they didn't really use the word inflation like in modern times. You could search Eliot's debates, like the debates over ratification and then the Philadelphia Convention. And I don't even think the word inflation comes up. Instead, they regularly used a term or a word called depreciation because they recognized that price increases were often the result of lower purchasing power and usually associated with fiat paper money. So they would refer to, if we're talking about, oh, inflation, they instead looked at it from the other direction and would say, look, oh, the depreciation of these bank notes or these paper notes or the continental notes or whatever it was that they were discussing at the time. It was depreciation of the money. And here's how Thomas Jefferson, let me pull it up on the screen. In 1814, in a letter to Thomas Cooper, he basically summed up this view. And I know it's kind of small on the screen. I don't know what's going on. I'll figure it out. Anyways, he said, everything predicted by the enemies of banks in the beginning is now coming to pass. We are to be ruined now by the deluge of bank paper as we were formerly by the old continental paper. Hmm. Going to be ruined by a deluge of paper. And I did an episode a couple of months ago, I think in June, it looks like June 15, 2022. I told the story of how, well, uh, Jefferson basically called it. And within a year, it was the beginning of America's first great economic crisis. And that's eight founders on the evils of paper money. Of course, I will link to that in the show notes, 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty. And that brings me to inflation today. And Ludwig von Mises over at Mises.org, this is a translation transcript of a lecture he gave back in the 1950s. This is a really, I'm going to read through this, and I think this is a great explanation. He said, if the supply of caviar were as plentiful as the supply of potatoes, the price of caviar, that is the exchange ratio between caviar and money or caviar and other commodities would change considerably. In that case, one could obtain caviar at a much smaller sacrifice than is required today. Likewise, he said, if the quantity of money is increased, the purchasing power of the monetary unit decreases and the quantity of goods that can be obtained for one unit of this money decreases also. So the more you have of something, the less valuable it is, whether it's caviar or food or uh, some type of commodity, or if it is a unit of exchange what we call money or fiat money, the dollar. It doesn't matter what is being used. The more of it, the less valuable. Mises goes on. He said, in the same way today, when a government increases the quantity of paper money, the result is that the purchasing power of the money unit 
begins to drop, monetary unit begins to drop, and so prices rise. This is called inflation. So inflation is an increase in the amount of money. The, uh, the result of the increase in the amount of money is that prices start to rise. Uh, and that is, we can call it monetary inflation, which would be the original definition of inflation, and then price inflation, which is just an outgrowth of actual inflation. Now, let's talk a little bit about how government uses this. Now, when government wants to do stuff, they've got to come up with money to pay for it, right? And generally, the standard way of doing it is they'd have to tax people. And the more that they'd have to tax, the harder it would be to expand government because over time, people would groan under that tax and it would be very difficult. And here's how Mises put it. But if the government does not use tax money for this purpose, if it uses freshly printed money instead, it means that there will be people who now have more money while all the other people still have just as much money as they had before. So those who receive the newly printed money will be competing with those people who were buyers before. And since there are no more commodities than there were pre previously, but there is more money on the market, and since there are now more now people who can buy more today than they could have bought yesterday because they have new money, there will be an additional demand for that same quantity of goods. And supply and demand means once there's an additional demand, the price goes up. Therefore, he said, prices will tend to go up. This cannot be avoided no matter what the use of this newly issued money will be. And the effect of this is also, it's not just that... I mean, really, it's the people that are closest to government, the the corporate interests that are doing the government contracts. They benefit most because they get the money first here. For example, take a look at uh, what Mises has to say. Prices do not change to the same extent, same extent at the same time. So if they print an extra trillion dollars, it doesn't mean that all prices all across society go up at the same rate at the same time. What they're being spent on first will probably stay the same. And then once a bunch of new money pours into that, then those prices go up and then those people have more money and then they can spend it on other stuff. And then it trickles down and <laughs> not in a good way at all. And it dries prices up throughout the entire system. Uh, so, again, prices do not change to the same extent at the same time. There are always prices that are changing more rapidly, rising or falling more rapidly than other prices. And there is a reason for this. Mises says the additional money which the government has printed and introduced in the market is not used for the purchase of all commodities and services. It is used for the purchase of certain ones. So the military industrial complex or if they're building, doing infrastructure programs or whatever it may be, those prices tend to go up earliest the prices of which will rise while other commodities will remain at the still remain at the prices that prevailed before the new money was put on the market therefore he says when inflation starts different groups within the population are affected by this inflation in different ways those groups who get the new money first gain a temporary benefit and the people who get the money last it's generally the people who don't have connections with politicians with government and the ones without government connections by the time it shows up they're already paying higher prices in many cases across the board and then maybe they'll get a stimulus or some kind of a handout or they'll get a, a higher wage at some point, but it doesn't match up with the price increase that was caused by the increase in the monetary supply. So this is really a way to give more bonuses, more incentive, more support to the people who are closest to government power. And it really is just a ripoff of the average person's day-to-day -day existence. And then if you think about the people who are, and I don't like doing a class warfare thing, but the people who can barely get by, who are struggling to pay for things paycheck to paycheck, who have no savings, when prices go up 10, 15, 20%, that can make or break their existence in many situations. But someone who's making a quarter million dollars and eggs go from $3 to $7, I mean, they don't want to pay the extra four bucks, 
but it's not going to break them. So this really is an attack on the poor like none other. Uh, over at Shift Gold, there's a really interesting FAQ on on inflation. And they point out that as recently as the 1970s, they talked about this definition uh, of inflation as being an increase of the money supply. And here they say a 70s, 1970s dictionary gives us a similar definition to what Mises was saying. A, quote, a sharp increase in the amount of money and credit causing advances in the price level. Notice they write that the definition mentions rising prices but only as a symptom of inflation. Inflation itself is defined as an increase in the amount of money and credit. And they go on saying, over the years, the government, along with its apologists in the corporate media and academia, altered the definition to suit government purposes. They do this with everything. They've redefined the, the meaning of the word uh, commerce and necessary and proper and, well, shall not be infringed, for example, or what a recession is. But now they, of course, for decades have been redefining what inflation is. And they focus on the price increase rather than what inflation is. It's something done by government, increasing the monetary supply. The standard definition of inflation, uh, they point out, bandied about today is nothing more than government propaganda. And Mises explained the problem with changing that this definition to talk about inflation not as being depreciation like the founding generation understood it to be, a loss of purchasing power because you're flooding the market with more dollars or with more paper currency instead being just the price. Mises understood, I think this was in the 1950s as well, understood that this caused really nasty results. And it's a little bit long, but let me read this. He said, there is nowadays a very reprehensible, even dangerous semantic confusion that makes it extremely difficult for the non-expert to grasp the true state of affairs. Inflation, as this term was always used everywhere, and especially in this country, means increasing the quantity of money in bank, bank notes in circulation and the quantity of bank deposits subject to check. But people today use the term inflation to refer to the phenomenon that is an in inevitable consequence of inflation. That is the tendency of all prices and wage rates to rise. The result of this deplorable confusion is that there is no term left to signify the cause of this rise in price and wages, prices and wages. Government loves this because if government is doing the inflation and they can keep people distracted and have them focus on the result of the inflation and just call it that, then they get away with all kinds of stuff. And Mises understands this, or he understood this. He says, as you cannot talk about something that has no name, you cannot fight it. Those who pretend to fight inflation are, in fact, only fighting what is the inevitable consequence of inflation, rising prices. Their ventures are doomed to failure because they do not attack the root of the evil. And that's really what Thomas Jefferson was getting to as well in a letter to John Adams all the way back in 1819. So in 1814, he's like, oh, we're about to be ruined. And then by 1819, they had been getting ruined pretty bad for a number of years. This was a very, very bad situation, 1815 through 21. And he said, the evils of this deluge of paper money are not to be removed until our citizens are generally and radically instructed in their cause and consequences. So if Jefferson could understand in 1819 the cause and consequence of printing a bunch of paper money, certainly we should have the brains to be able to figure this out today, but well, maybe not, maybe not. Again, the evils of this deluge of paper money are not to be removed. He expected it to continue over and over and over, boom and bust cycle, which is what we've seen for the last couple of centuries, right? Until our citizens are generally and radically instructed in their cause and consequences. Here again from uh, Shift Gold, they say, in other words, the modern definition allows policymakers to shift the blame. And that's really what I was getting at. Because if inflation is the result of what government is doing, instead of what government's doing, then all the so-called solutions address the result. And then you miss the cause and you never solve the problem. 
They go on and they say, if we use the traditional definition of inflation as an expansion of the supply of money, the culprit becomes clear. Who expands the supply of money? Well, it's the Fed and the federal government. So if you accurately define inflation, you'll know exactly who's to blame. But if the government can fool people into believing that an effective inflation is inflation, they can blame it on everybody but themselves. A really nice page. I will link to that FAQ page over at 10th Amendment Center dot com slash path to liberty and hear from Henry Hazlitt also over at Mises dot org. This is an old one, but this is um, inflation. A cure, I believe, is what it's called. A cure for inflation. And he says inflation to sum up is the increase in the volume of money and bank credit in relation to the volume of goods. It is harmful because it depreciates the value of the monetary unit. Again, just like what the founding generation, you can look in uh, the debates over ratification, you can see it come up a bunch of times in various states, depreciation of paper. That They all understood what that meant. The paper was worth less, and so you could buy less. It is harmful because it depreciates the value of the monetary unit. It raises everybody's cost of living. It imposes what is, in effect, a tax on the poorest without exemptions at as high a rate as the tax on the richest. It wipes out the value of past savings. It discourages future savings. It redistributes wealth and income wantonly. It encourages and rewards speculation and gambling at the expense of thrift and work. It undermines confidence in the justice of a free enterprise system and corrupts public and private morals. That's Henry Hazlitt. I will link to that full uh, article in the show notes at 10th Amendment Center dot com slash path to liberty. It's really it, Hazlitt just hammered it home and he was such a great writer. But it's very similar to what George Washington warned about in a letter to Jabez Brown in January of 1787. He said paper money has had the effect in your state that it ever will have to ruin commerce, oppress the honest and open a door to every species of fraud and injustice. Well, I hope you guys found this interesting. I hope it was educational. More important than anything, I hope you learned something. I really appreciate you spending some of your time with me today. If you like this type of information, you want to help us get this out to more and more people, nothing helps us get that job done. Roll up our sleeves every single day to do this kind of work. More than the financial faith and support of our members, you can join us for as little as two bucks a month today over at 10thamendmentcenter.com slash members. It's all spelled out, 10thamendmentcenter.com slash members. Again, I really appreciate you spending some of your time with me today. I hope you have a great weekend, and I'll see you next week here on the Path to Liberty.